Perfect. All right. Do we hit? Do we sound the klaxon horn now? <laughs> well, you can. Uh, it may be a little anticlimactic to do it at this point, but uh, <laughs> uh, so thanks. Thanks for having me again. Uh, you're now on my favorite topic, which is modern submarines. Um, just for background, for those that I haven't met, and there's a lot of people I see attending tonight. Um, my name's Chuck Fralick. I am a retired Navy officer. I was a submariner, an oceanographer. My background is, is ocean engineering. I retired in 2002, did uh, 23 years. I uh, spent a lot of time under the water and under the ice for that matter. So the topic of uh, submarines and operations is, my goodness, I, I could literally spend all day talking to you about this topic. So I've tried to whittle it down to something that's manageable. I've got lots of pretty pictures. I, I believe in shock and awe more than I do text. So uh, lots of pictures here. So let's go ahead and get started. Little disclaimer, this is not to protect me, guys. It says all materials are researched from open sources. Uh, because of my former affiliation and what I do these days, I, I don't want to represent anything as being any material generated by the U.S. government, which it is not. This presentation is for education purposes only and is not intended to be sold. That gets me out of any copyright infringement issues with the people that have been kind enough to give me some of these images. And you can't reuse this without permission of me. Of course, I don't mind if you guys have this on your YouTube site. That's, again, just a disclaimer that protects from a copyright infringement. That's all. All right. Submarines today. A lot of people have seen plenty of World War II movies, and they think that what submarines do from day to day is hunt other ships and submarines and sink them. Of course. Are we supposed to be seeing a picture now? Yes. You, are you not? No, I'm not. I'm seeing your head. Uh-oh. Hold on. So I'm seeing the picture, so I have no idea what's going on. Okay. Don't see there we go. Oh, there you go. Hold on. Here we go. That's uh, what you saw in the background there is part of my files. I literally, I, I probably literally have the world's largest collection of submarine photos. <laughs> Just as an FYI. All right. So let me go into presentation mode. How about now, guys? Good. Roger. Okay. Perfect. The real mission of submarines today is not running around shooting torpedoes at targets. The last time a submarine launched a weapon in anger was during the Falklands, um, not since. Uh, that is, of course, what we train heavily to do. Uh, the primary mission of, of fast attack submarines or hunter killer submarines is sub on sub or sub on ship engagement, which we call ASUW or anti surface warfare. Special forces support, special mission support. So that's things like, for example, putting SEALs out of lockout chambers so they can go on their way and do nefarious things to the enemy. But the primary mission of submarines today of all navies around the world is surveillance. Now that surveillance is in the form of electronic surveillance, collecting signals over the airways, if you will, or photography, or just tracking and trailing contacts of interest. It can even be drug runners. U.S. military forces routinely get involved in counter-narcotics activity. But all of that's part of the larger umbrella of surveillance. That's the big mission today. In wartime, that shifts to a different role, which is that hunter-killer and anti-surface warfare type of activity. All right. Deterrence. Deterrence is a specialized mission that's performed, of course, by ballistic missile submarines. Uh, unfortunately, the world has got a growing number of ballistic missile submarines. We, of course, in the USA operate them, the UK, France, Russia, China, India, and North Korea. I expect 20 years from now, you'll see some additional players in that world. And that's an unfortunate thing because they are really horrific weapons if used in anger. So generally speaking, I mentioned hunter killers or fast attack submarines. Fast attack is what we call an SS or an SSN. And a ballistic missile submarine we call an SSB or an SSBN if it's nuclear. Further, that's divided into, of course, different types of propulsion. And that's hence the N after the SSN or SSBN. There's either nuclear power diesel electric or diesel electric AIP or air independent propulsion. So that's a couple of different possible ways of generating 
electricity underwater, which drives electric motors. One version of AIP is called a PEM, Proton Exchange Membrane Fuel Cell. If you've seen fuel cell cars, the Germans use a very large version of that in their 212 submarines. And they can operate for weeks underwater on AIP power. It's pretty phenomenal. There are other versions of AIP. There are Stirling cycle engines. There's Kristall, which is the Russian version of an AIP. So just to give you a feel that submarines are not simply one type of design, it's many different designs and they're tailored to the end user application. All right, so SSN or SS operations. Again, I promised you pretty pictures in the upper left, by the way, that's, that's an astute class submarine that belongs to the UK. That's a fast attack submarine with a dry deck shelter on the back. Dry deck shelters are used to lock in and out special forces and the vehicles that they may use. And those can be little miniature submarines, SDVs, swimmer delivery vehicles that we use in the US Navy for special forces. Upper right is an Arctic, that's a SISEX. For many years during the Cold War, you know, the military is a funny thing. You're very myopic about what you're spending money on from year to year. So SISEXs went the way of the dodo for a while because the military began to view the Arctic as irrelevant. Well, now that the ice is melting in the Arctic, everybody is interested in the Arctic. So we're going back to the ice again. Uh, we probably should have maintained some more significant level of activity up there all along, but lesson learned. So I mentioned ESM or surveillance. If you look in the middle there, that middle shot, that antenna all the way over on the left is called a pert spring. This is a Russian series of antennas, by the way. Their DF loop, direction finding loop is in the middle. That's bracketed by two periscopes. We have normally have two types of periscopes on a submarine, an attack scope, which is a small diameter scope. So when it's protruding out of the water, it produces less of a wake, less of a feather, they call it. And then a surveillance scope, which has generally got better optics. And so it can be longer range and offer more features like multi-spectral types of things. And then finally to the far right is, is a snoop tray radar that the Russians are famous for using on their submarines. That gives you an idea of the types of sensors that are available for use. I mentioned an SDV, swimmer delivery vehicle. That's a U.S. Navy swimmer delivery vehicle on the lower left there with a couple of seals already in place. One of the other jobs I did on submarines, uh, every submarine's got a dive locker. You got a few divers on board for various things. I actually got to occasionally go in the water and observe this on the boats that had uh, dry deck shelters installed. It's fascinating to do. Very difficult though, even a two knot current is enough to blow a diver away from a submarine. So it's, it's a pretty hairy operation and these guys deserve all the credit they, uh, that we can give them. Some more mass and antennas you see down at the bottom, that's actually a 688 class submarine you see uh, with the greenish mast on the left with a scope, with a periscope to the right of it. And then on the far right, that is a, a British submarine, UK submarine, I believe that is a Trafalgar class with its mass out of the water. Okay. I will speed up, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction and I, I believe me, I wanna leave opportunity for questions if they come up. So a little bit more about special forces. This is a, a relatively recent evolution has included lots of dry deck shelters, so specialized uh, accommodations for SEALs or other special forces in other countries. And I, you'll see a couple of different variations on this as we go through the presentation. The one on the upper right is the astute class submarine. The Brits have a really, I think, elegant solution to installing the dry deck shelter on the, ba on the back uh, of the, we call it the casing of the submarine there, and they plug it into the back of the sail. So then they access another escape trunk in the back of the sail. And so it's much more streamlined than what we do, which is simply bolting it over an escape trunk and mating it to the escape trunk. Brits are, Brits are pretty crafty when it comes to designing submarines. The Astute is a really bizarre looking, but very capable submarine. And you'll see some more about that in a minute. By the way, today, for the most part, the submarines that we operate that carry dry deck shelters are now those converted Ohio class ballistic missile submarines that are called SSGNs now. There's four out of the 18 that are converted for that. And that's what you see in that middle picture there with the tug next to it. That's one of the converted Ohio class boats. All right, so SSBN operations. I'll talk a little bit more about SSNs in a minute, but uh, 
SSBNs are, are peculiar in that they don't run around the world's oceans constantly, um, you know, just roaming around. They generally pick locations that are called bastions. Now, I'm not going to comment on U.S. bastions because I'm guilty of too much background on that. So I'm just going to leave it at this, this document that came out of James Lacey's book, War on the Rocks, and it talks about SSBNs. I will comment on uh, the ones on the left, which show, uh, which are the Chinese, for example, bastions. That is probably accurate, and that the Chinese over time have become a defensive Navy, and now they're getting into power projection. So they've built an aircraft carrier. They've built SSBNs now called a Gen, um, and they had the former Jia class SSBN. The Gen is a much more capable submarine, and every year the Chinese improve their technology in SSBNs and submarines in general. So the, the takeaway from this is the Chinese are steadily progressing their influence away from coastal operations to, to blue water operations. Um, you know, I, I'm far from a warmonger. I, I think we get in too many conflicts as it is, but I, I will tell you this, the Chinese are not our friends and they will absolutely dominate it, at least the Pacific, if not the rest of the world, if given half a chance. That's, that's my firm belief. And we are in danger of falling behind in some areas technologically to the Chinese. Submarine operators of the world. Boy, there are lots of them. 42 countries operate submarines, 15 formerly operated submarines. The list of countries that operate submarines tends to grow every year. Uh, I've got a number down there of submarines in the world of 492. It's actually greater than that now. It's more like 512, I think, is the latest count of active combat submarines in the world. So you might want to ask yourself, my goodness, why are there so many submarines in the world? So the answer is pretty simple. Any nation that's got any kind of coast whatsoever has a maritime interest. That maritime interest includes their exclusive economic zone and protection of their resources, even merchants, uh, over time. The most asymmetric way of, of accomplishing that protection of their interests is with a submarine. Submarines are sinister, <laughs> silent, deadly. Uh, they're expensive, but it would take three times the number of surface ships to accomplish what a submarine can do from a, a counter shipping or counter bad activity on a coastline sort of a way. So submarines are viewed as being a must have by most coastal nations with any kind of wherewithal financially at all. And, the, and submarines, I mentioned they are expensive, they are extremely expensive. The cheapest diesel electric submarine of any consequence being built today is about $600 million. The cheapest nuclear submarine being built today is probably 1.1 to 1.2 billion dollars and western nuclear submarines are upwards of two and a half to three billion dollars per copy. Columbia class which is the replacement for Ohio, Ohio class the SSBNs that new class of SSBN is reported to be costing six billion dollars per, per hull. That's a phenomenal amount of money but yet countries that don't have anywhere near the economic power we do invest in submarines. So it, it's a pretty phenomenal occurrence throughout the world today. Okay. This is submarines of the world back in 2015. There've been a few changes to this. I mean, an example is the French have come out with what they call the Suffren, which is a Barracuda class nuclear submarine and the Scorpene, which is the conventional diesel version of that submarine smaller, which is being built uh, for Australia now, as an example. But this just gives you an idea of the dizzying number of, of active submarine classes in the world. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. One has gone away from active operation, and that's the Typhoon in the upper left, which is unfortunate because that was an, an absolutely magnificent submarine, uh, fabulous submarine, huge. That one's out of service. They do have one in reserve, but they're not active anymore. By the way, guys, once I get through this, I'll be happy to come back to any page if you've got a specific question. I'm just trying to get through all the material so that you can see it all, and then we can, we can have more of a deep dive if we have time. So what makes a good submarine today? Well, lots of things. 
first and foremost, it has to be quiet. And don't get the idea. You probably heard, um, well, you probably saw Hunt for Red October, for example, as a movie. And you get the impression that submarines are whisper quiet. They're you know, like the noise of an electric fan moving through the water. Believe me, that's far from the truth. The average submarine, I don't care if it's nuclear or diesel electric, when it's running as quiet as it can, is still much louder than a rock concert is moving through the water. But you have to understand that the ocean is a very complicated environment. And so what seems like of a lot of acoustic energy in the water, once it interacts with the ocean and the bottom and the surface, that energy doesn't transmit all that far. So every decibel you can save and noise radiated from a submarine makes you more stealthy and less detectable. So there is always a huge push to be as quiet as possible. I'm happy to say that the United States and our allies generally have the quietest submarines in the world. Good tactical speed. So I don't mean can a submarine blaze along at 50 miles an hour. Um, that's not what good tactical speed is. Good tactical speed is the ability to relocate as fast as possible while maintaining situational awareness. And what do I mean by that? If you're moving, I'm, I'm going to pick an arbitrary number. If you're moving at 10 knots and you can hear extremely well, that's much more valuable than moving at 12 knots and not being able to hear anything. So tactical speed is the ability to maintain full situational awareness of what's going on around you while still moving at as fast a pace as possible. So that's tactical speed. Endurance. The great advantage of nuclear submarines today is absolutely limitless endurance. The only thing that limits the endurance of a nuclear submarine is food, plain and simple. We make our own air, we make our own water, power is limitless, modern nuclear reactors uh, both ours and the UK and France are designed for 33 plus years of continuous service without refueling. Vastly different than the old days. I was on submarines where we had to refuel about every six years. And that was, that's a hugely expensive, you know, these days, $500 million evolution to refuel a, a submarine. Good passive sonar performance. The only way you know what's going on around you on a submarine when you're submerged is with sonar. And I don't mean active sonar, so it's passive. You have to be able to listen effectively. And that includes listening in front of you and behind you. That's called baffles behind you. And you probably saw in Hunt for Red October, they did a maneuver called clearing baffles or crazy Ivan. That's a way to turn so that your sonar is then more effective. You have broadsides or bow. Uh, sonar uh, capacity pointed at potential targets in the distance. All that is part of exercising good passive sonar performance. Good weapons. Generally speaking, submarines carry two types of weapons, uh, torpedoes. I don't know of any combat submarine on the planet that does not carry torpedoes, heavyweight torpedoes, and even increasingly so cruise missiles today. Uh, most modern navies, the United States, UK, China, Russia, Japan, carry cruise missiles in, a, in addition to torpedoes. That's for anti-ship activity and land strike. Good weapons capacity. If you can only carry two torpedoes, you, you're not going to be much of a good submarine in a, in a fight. So typically, modern submarines carry somewhere around 15 to 30 weapons in their stoves. Good ancillary sensor capability. You'll see more about that in a minute. I, I mentioned some of the mass antennas, but I will show you some things that the Russians do that are pretty interesting as we get to the Russian section. Good crew training is absolutely, if I had to pick one thing that's the most important, assuming you have a modicum of capability in these other areas, it's good crew training. I tend to believe that the United States has the best overall crew training. Um, I'll also tell you, I think that the Brits probably have the best commanding officer training program. It's called Perisher, and it is phenomenally good. Very rigorous. They have a very high failure rate in their Perisher course. So that sets the stage a little bit. So what's the problem for Western navies when it comes to submarines? Now, this came, came from the Office of Naval Intelligence. This was a publicly released document. I'm not giving away any secrets. Uh, this is all relative, of course, there are no numbers on this to tell you what the radiated noise levels are, but what you should look at and appreciate is the trend. 
So go back to the 70s and look at where that Victor One Russian submarine was and look at where our 637 or Sturgeon class was. We had a monumental lead over them in quieting. Over the preceding 40 plus years though, they have closed the gap significantly and some would argue, I, I won't make a com personal comment on it, some would argue that the latest Russian submarine, the Sever Advinsk, and specifically the Hull 2, is as quiet as anything we have. I, I, again, I won't make a comment on that, but at least it gives you a feel for what the Russians have done to progress their quiet in their submarine fleet. Chinese, at this point in time, the Chinese are hacks when it comes to building quiet submarines, but they will eventually get there. So a little bit about uh, generics uh, nuclear submarine construction. <clears throat> Every nuclear submarine has got a boiler, which is a nuclear reactor. That nuclear reactor pumps hot water into a steam generator. Fresh water is pumped into that steam generator on the opposite side of some conduction material like tubes, tube bundles. They generate high pressure steam. That high pressure steam goes to steam turbines and they either spin electric motors or shafts or ship service motor generators. So bottom line, they produce propulsive power and electric power in one, in one of two ways, either directly or, or electrically. That's how reactors work, it's plain and simple. Here's just a breakdown. This is from a UK site. Again, I'm not giving away. US nuclear information is still relatively tightly controlled. Uh, so I won't comment on anything we do directly, but I'll just say this is just a, a cartoon of of how a reactor plant on a submarine operates. Again, on the left, you've got the reactor, control rod motors. I won't even get into that part of it. Pressurizer just maintains pressure in the core and over the primary loop, which is the, the, the loop that passes coolant. You see the red part, that's the primary loop. Then the secondary loop is where the fresh water is and it's, gener it's where the steam generator is and generates steam and you can see the rest, rest of the path there. And forgive me if that sounds a little vague, but uh, I really can't get any more of that. Uh, nuclear submarine construction Ford. So today, in today's modern navies, um, still the predominance of weapons are launched out of torpedo tubes. However, the United States and a few other navies now have vertical launch tubes for weapons on board submarines. Uh, that's for missiles, not for submarines. Uh, the Virginia class, for example, has now got two types of tubes up forward. Uh, in one configuration, they have 12 tubes that have individual doors. So, so think of a ballistic missile submarine only for fast attacks. It's for cruise missiles. And the other version is called the Virginia payload tube. So the Virginia payload tube is a bigger door, which covers six individual launch tubes all in one cylinder. And you'll, you'll, I, I believe I have an example of that later that I'll show you. And then you have uh, torpedo tubes. Now, some people ask, well, why are the torpedo tubes on the port and starboard side and angled and not straight out the bow? Well, that's because you've got sonar in the bow. And th most torpedo tubes are angled port and starboard outward uh, six to 10 degrees, depending on the class of submarine. And that's to clear the hull when they're, when they're launched, okay? And uh, diesel electric submarines, it's a pretty simple configuration. Uh, you've got a, a diesel engine which spins a generator which charges a battery or goes directly to an electric motor and turns the shaft. Uh, one of the best submarines in the world today, by the way, is a diesel electric submarine and it's the Russian Kilo class. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Up four, it's a very similar layout to nuclear submarines. However, in some cases, i.e. the Kilo, you see up forward there, the, the torpedo tubes do go directly through the bow. That's because they have what's called a cylindrical array that is below the torpedo tubes for their sonar. They don't have a spherical array or a big wraparound sonar array on the bow. There are some advantages to cylindrical arrays. Um, directionality is one. But the Russians uh, are fairly, well, the Chinese do have a copy of this called a Yuan, which also has similar tubes. And I, you'll see a picture of that as well. Let me pause just for a second because I'm talking really fast. Anybody have any questions so far on this? Okay. I have a question. Sure. Uh, steam, does that make a lot of uh, audible sound because of either the pressure, the waves that may be coming off of it? 
uh, waves that are like vaporized or is it contained in the hull? Okay, so steam that's generated in a steam generator. And this applies, by the way, to conventional surface ships that have boilers that don't have reactors. The reactor is just another heat source. So when you generate that steam, it, you are piping that steam through large diameter piping that runs back to the main engines and, and ship service turbine generators. So anything spun by a turbine. So the, for a 30 second view of how that works, yes, it makes noise because there's flow noise inside those pipes. Right. We put lagging around pipes and, and Navy vessels and that quiets that quite a bit, but it still makes noise. Uh, it, it's not the loudest source of noise on, on any Navy platform, but it, it's still significant. So that steam then is exhausted through that turbine. So you, what you're doing is you're converting thermal energy and kinetic energy or, or moving steam vapor across turbine blades. So if you've ever held the pinwheel and you blow on it, it's a similar principle. Once that steam makes its way all the way through, through the turbine, it exhausts into a condenser. That condenser uses seawater to cool tubes that steam flows over those tubes and is condensed into a well at the bottom of the condenser and it's recycled back through the steam plant again. So that's the basic principle on how every steam plant operates. Would it be uh, more quiet to use electrolytic fluid, which would have no noise maybe? The problem is steam is a very good efficient transfer of energy. We have experimented with different conducting materials. The Russians, for example, experimented with lead bismuth as a cooling medium in their plants many, many years ago, and it failed miserably. Mm. One, one of the problems with lead bismuth, is if, you, if the plant ever cooled down, it, it locked up like a block of ice. You could never restart it. So it, it's very problematic. Steam is just so tried and true and elegantly simple in its basic principles that there has been no motivation to, to move away from it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey One Chuck, question. this is uh, this is John. Um, you talked a little bit about the AIP submarines, and yes. uh, I believe that the uh, Swedish Gotland class is yes. a uh, an AIP, correct? That's correct. That's a Stirling cycle type of a, an engine. So they burn a hydrocarbon at relatively high temperature, very high efficiency, and they they generate thermal energy that way and it moves a piston and generates electricity it's a very good system and it's 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 always interesting to me why different navies pick different flavors of aip um, the germans are absolutely convinced that the fuel cell is the way to go the swedes are absolutely convinced that that sterling cycle mesma is a is another name for that uh is the way to go me if i were to pick one i think i think at this stage in technology, I would go fuel cell. It's easier to manage. Okay, that's right. I was just going to ask you what you thought about that yeah. Gotland. Uh, yeah, it's a very good submarine. In fact, we practice as a Navy with the, the, the Gotland class submarines pretty regularly. It's a, it's a very capable submarine, although they're replacing their submarines in the near future. All right, thank you. Sure. So this is a Virginia class, and I mentioned that Virginia payload tube, multiple all-up canister called a MAC, is up forward. You see those 12 individual doors above the missile tubes have been replaced by two large ones with a canister that's got six missiles in it each. The reason they've gone that route is it gives the Navy much more flexibility in what they can host in those tubes. So it can be something much larger than a cruise missile if they really wanted to. What that might be, uh, you know, I won't comment on, but at any rate. Um, Virginia is a wonderful submarine. I've been on a few, I've been on the John Warner. Absolutely fabulous submarines. Very high tech. Rick Over would be turning over in his grave, though, because there are digital instruments everywhere. They have reactor plant manuals, which is the Bible of nuclear operations on a submarine. They're in digital format. He would not have liked any of that. But they are wonderful submarines. Uh, trust me. There's a picture of some consoles in the upper right on a Virginia class and on the lower right. Wonderful submarine already designed its, its replacement. Actually, the, the Navy actually is calling it an evolution of the Virginia class, but uh, I don't know, we'll see. 
I, and by the way, I'm only showing you active classes. And in most cases, I'm only showing you the best of those active classes. And I'll, I'll make a few comments as we go through. Seawolf, only three built. The logic at the time was we, built, we were building the Seawolf. It was supposed to be a 33 boat class. We built the Seawolf to fight a blue water conflict and it's not suitable for littorals or shallow water. Guys, complete BS. They stopped building Seawolves because they were too expensive and wanted to spend money on something else. That's why they stopped building Seawolf. Seawolf, my opinion, the best submarine on the planet, bar none. It's fast, it's large, carries lots of weapons. It is a wonderful submarine. There are a few pictures of it on the interior there. That's the, the dive station there on the boat. So that's in control. There's the, the uh, sonar array in the upper right. The Rolls Royce of submarines. I mentioned the Astute earlier, the UK Astute. Fabulous submarine. So the UK on a very a meager budget relative to what we spend, comes up with the most interesting designs. So look at the hull on that thing. It's, it's almost Jules Verne looking in the way that it's angled and, and so forth. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, it's quiet. It shares a lot of propulsion plant design characteristics with ours. Uh, the Brits are good at sonar. You'll, you'll see, uh, can you see the mouse when I move it here? Do you see this? Yeah. Those are large aperture arrays. So that's sonar on the side. The reason you have arrays like that on a submarine is they allow you to, do, to measure wave front hitting the submarine acoustically. So sonar information propagated through the ocean. And you can, based on the time of arrival on various parts of that array, you can tell where that signal came from. So it's a way to localize contacts efficiently with sonar. By the way, you can also see the torpedo tubes down on the bow they're angled out to the side as well. They don't penetrate the bow directly. So similar in design to ours. I get this question a lot, by the way. Why do we have the, the dive planes up forward on the casing and not on the sail? The simple answer is, in really rough weather, there's, there's two answers. In really rough weather, if you're on the surface, those bow planes, as they're called, give you much better control of the submarine and help control porpoising as opposed to having what we call fair water planes. So that's the reason you see that. That's one reason. The other reason is if you do any under ice operations, if you wanted to surface through the ice with a submarine with fair water planes or planes on the sail, you would have to tilt them in the under ice position so they would have to be vertical to be able to punch through the ice. So that meant you had to articulate those planes 90 degrees every time you wanted to surface through the ice. It's not that that's difficult technically to do, it's just the apparatus to do that is more complex. The bow planes, on the other hand, fold into the casing. So they fold out of the way, very simple. It's a single pivot operation and it's just easier to accomplish. So that, those are the two reasons why you see bow planes. Hey Chuck, just one, one question. So I, I look at the Astute class and then you, know, you take a look at the Virginia, for example, or the Seawolf, and the length seems to be very different. We seem to have kind of thinner, longer submarines. The Astute, it looks like it's shorter and a whole lot fatter. It is. And I'm pausing for a second to make sure I can say what I want to say. Uh, yes, okay. So in, in naval architecture, there is generally an ideal length to beam ratio. There are a lot of things that go into the calculation of how long you make a submarine. It, diameter is an important consideration and then length is an important consideration for the volume that's encased in the pressure vessels. The problem with long submarines is there's almost a direct correlation in length of submarine and cost of submarine when it comes to nuclear boats. And so it becomes a vicious tail chasing exercise as to how big you make the submarine. The Brits chose a shorter length and a stubbier profile. One, it's hydrodynamically efficient. It's more efficient than a long fin design actually. And two, it was a cost saving measure to save some cost in the production of the submarines. That's, those are the simple answers. Um, Thank you, good, sure. good answer. Upper right, 
I, I don't do them enough service with this single picture. The Japanese have built some wonderful submarines their last two classes. Soryu is the current one. There are two of those in service today. Uh, the one that uh, preceded it, Oyashio, is a similar design, but the Soryu is an evolution. It's quieter. And the last couple in the Soryu class have lithium ion batteries rather than lead acid batteries as their main battery. That is unheard of in the submarine community. The, the reason why we have stuck so doggedly with lead acid over the years, and by the way, nuclear submarines have batteries just as large as conventional submarines do. They are enormous, 126 cells the size of a refrigerator. That's how many batteries are on many submarines. Lead Lincoln acid Christian. has very high surge capacity. So you can draw a lot of current very quickly off of a lead acid battery. And they are tried and true. They've been around for how long? 150 years, probably, whatever it is now. Uh, lithium ion has a bad reputation of causing fires. You guys remember the, the Boeing aircraft debacle, uh, 787 Dreamliner fires, and that stopped them from operating for a while. You've heard of laptop batteries burning uh, on airplanes, all lithium ion. So the Japanese have now figured out a way to make propagation, in other words, fires can't spread throughout the battery, propagation resistant lithium ion batteries, and they've been certified for use on Japanese submarines. The advantage they have is they are much lighter in weight than lead acid. They have similar energy density, so the similar amount of energy per battery cell, and they will last longer than lead acid batteries with very little maintenance. Maintenance is a big issue with lead acid batteries on submarines. Sparks are a big issue with lead acid batteries because they, they off gas lots of hydrogen when they're being charged. So it, it really is a phenomenal accomplishment. Oh, by the way, the Japanese also have AIP on some of their submarines. Below going that, back, go ahead. I'm sorry, going back to like the, the length of the submarines, the Astute versus Seawolf versus Virginia. Right. When it comes to turning in the water, is the Astute faster? Well, so then you get into propulsion plant, how many shaft horsepower they have. So it's a complicated question to answer. Uh, Some of the sportiest, meaning fastest turning submarines are actually, in fact, there's, is there one? Yeah, there's one on this page, the French Amethyst, which is a, an evolution of the Ruby class submarine. They're nuclear, they're the world's smallest nuclear combat submarines. They're little hot rods. They're not fast top speed wise, but they handle very lively. They're like sports cars. The bigger the submarine is, the, the generally speaking, the, the larger its turning radius is and the more cumbersome it is to handle. But you know, also keep in mind, submarines don't race around the ocean doing high speed turns most of the time. So there's always a compromise in that stuff. Um, below the Japanese Soryu is a French Suffren class. Now that's a nuclear submarine, but I mentioned that they make a diesel electric version, which is a shorter version of that submarine. And it's being sold to Australia among other countries. We have a but, question. Yep. Stupid, but has anybody figured out running a submarine on its side? Is there a way, just like you have your Harrier aircraft, not that the sailor is going to do something, but could there be a design where it favors, you know, the right or the left, and because of its side profile as opposed to rounded top bottom, has anybody ever thought about that? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, so. If you, I, I believe you were on the, you were uh, in attendance for the World War II brief and you remember the shapes of those submarines. They were very much like surface ships that submerged. That shape was very inefficient underwater. So the most efficient shape for a submarine is a teardrop. And one of the, the Albacore was a good example of that. Ultra high speed diesel electric boat. I mean, I can tell you what its top speed was. It's, it's, that's not a secret anymore. It was diesel electric, but it would do 36.3 knots underwater. That's blazing fast for, for a diesel electric. The reason it was so fast was it had an extremely efficient hull shape. Body of revolution, so it didn't have any weird shapes. I mean, the Astute's got a little bit of weirdness to it, but it's still a pretty hydrodynamically efficient shape. 
But as far as oddball shapes, like turning things on the side, the U.S. Navy actually experimented with that a long time ago, and they kept coming back to cylindrical shapes with sails like you see here, because number one, it's just more straightforward to manufacture, and they weren't seeing any huge gains by going to anything odd. So okay. that's, that's a partial answer. There's more to it than that, but I can't get into a lot of it. Um, Okay, French amethyst, I mentioned that, that's, a, that's an evolution of the Ruby class. And then, and, and this is an oddball because I called this Western submarines, but the Indians actually have a least Akula class from the Russians, it's called Chakra. This is the second nuclear submarine the Indians leased from the Russians. The first one was a Charlie class missile submarine, SSGN. The reason you might say, well, why would they lease a single nuclear submarine? Because, you know, there's always sort of about a 30% duty cycle on a submarine. You can only keep a submarine out at sea about 30% of the time. The rest of the time, it's got to be doing maintenance and upkeep and training and so on. The reason they did it, the Indians, is to get operational experience with nuclear submarines. And oh, by the way, the Akula is a good submarine, but the, the Indians are now building their own nuclear submarines. They built the Arahant, which is an SSBN. That was their first home-built nuclear submarine. And you'll, you'll see a picture of that in a minute. So these are SSBNs. There's the Ohio class on top. And yeah, that's really an SSGN picture, but they're the same boat other than some conversion details inside the hull. Huge boat, 540 feet, 30 some, close to 40,000 tons. Very quiet submarine being replaced by the Columbia class if we ever get to build it. Uh, lower left is the British, the UK Vanguard class, four of those operating. They're really cool. They, they have similarly Jules Verne looking features to the Astute class. Very good submarine as well. We share missile technology with the Brits. Uh, the Indians have one Arahant. You see it there in the middle right. Uh, guys, I, I would just tell you that thing's probably a piece of junk, but it's a learning exercise for them. And as they go through more classes and more builds, they'll get better at it. Finally on the bottom is the fr French Triomphant class. Very similar to our submarines in design. Uh, they have some differences. They had, tend to have some peculiarities when it comes to sonar, but all, all four of these are certainly capable of delivering a missile to target. Talk a little bit about Western weapons. Oh, by the way, so there's the shot in the upper left of the existing way that we do cruise missile launchers on submarines, individual doors over each tube. And you saw the Virginia payload tube version that had the canister, the Mac that slid down in the cylinder. So all the newer Virginia class submarines will be built with the two large doors over those Macs. All right, so weapons. Uh, Tomahawk is the missile of choice in the U.S. submarine community, BGM-109. Um, the only other country we sell that to is the U.K. You see the missile load out in the upper right. So they have these nice skids that fold out. They get bolted into place on the casing of the submarine, and they slide the torpedo down a ramp, and it goes through a passageway up into the torpedo room, and it's put on what they call weapon stoves or skids. It's a laborious process, but every submarine on the world has to go through some type of a loading process like that. That's a Mark 48 torpedo in the middle left picture with the sailors around it. My opinion, best heavyweight torpedo on the planet today. It's gone through several upgrades in its life cycle. Um, it, it's just a wonderful weapon. If, if a U.S. or a Canadian launches a Mark 48 at you uh, from a submarine in anger, you, uh, you might as well, you know, write your last will and testament. Uh, and that's a Mark 48 at the bottom as well. Is that thing dented? So, yeah, I knew somebody was going to ask that. That's a perfectly logical question. That's actually just a, a plastic sleeve that goes over the nose of the torpedo pr to protect the sonar. And I'll show you what the sonar looks on a Russian torpedo in a minute. We typically hide that because that's a, somewhat of a sensitive topic for us. 
Upper left, that's a UK Spearfish torpedo. It's it's another absolutely wonderful heavyweight torpedo. That's that's called a Sink X. So that's an old warship they shot a, a real war shot at and sunk that out at sea, became a reef. That gives you an idea of the explosive power. Nothing smaller than an aircraft carrier in operation today could survive the destructive power of a Mark 48 or a Spearfish torpedo. It might take two to sink an aircraft carrier. Um, upper right is another picture of the spearfish. Down below that is the is a German heavyweight called a sea hake. Below that's the Italian black shark. Below that's the French uh, F-21 Artemis. Below that is the Japanese Type 89. All are very similar in their capabilities. The best of the bunch are the spearfish and the Mark 48. For uh, missiles, uh, the Russians and Chinese are prolific producers of cruise missiles for submarine launch now. India has bought the designs for what's called a P-800 Onyx in Russia, and, and they are now building what's called a Brahmos as their indigenously produced version of that Russian cruise missile. These are nasty weapons, guys. Uh, supersonic missiles, hard to defeat, just they're scary. Now, cruise missiles in general are, are scary weapons. Uh, On the bot, quick, go ahead. Sorry, just a quick question: the the Brahmos missile is that is that the type of cruise missile that it, it flies up and then it, it uses a kind of like almost like an RCS thruster to kind of change its direction and then go flying off and uh, it, horizontally? Yeah, actually, if you do a Google. On, or if you search YouTube for Brahmos, that spelling right there, B-R-A-H-M-O-S, mm -hmm. you will likely come across a video of the Indian Navy launching a Brahmos from a surface ship. And in that, oh, okay. and in that implementation of that launch, that missile pops up out of a vertical tube. It gets up to probably 200 feet above the ship. A side thruster kicks it off to the right, and it takes off instantly. It's yeah, a it's really very, impressive video. Very interesting design, yeah. The Brahmos, the submarine launch version of the Brahmos, doesn't do that type of a launch sequence. It's launched vertically from a tube. It tends to pop up a little bit of an angle coming out of the water, and then it's on its way. I think I may have a shot of that somewhere here. Uh, Exocet. The Exocet's been around since, gosh, it's probably 45 years old now, maybe even older. They keep improving it. The submarine launch version of the French Exocet it's called the SM-39. And that picture you see in the lower left is that being loaded into a Scorpion-class diesel electric submarine. And that's a Brazilian submarine, by the way. Heavyweight torpedoes are bad news. Cruise missiles are worse. Current Russian combat submarine classes. The Russians are prolific builders of different designs of submarines. They are only today starting to focus more on more flexible designs, multi-purpose designs. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but let me touch on a couple of these really quickly. A Kula class submarine in the upper left, there are actually three variants of that that were built, very capable submarine. One of which I showed you was, was leased to India as the Chakra, very quiet. It was the first Russian submarine that approached Western standards of quietness and operational capability. Upper right is a Sierra. There are still a couple of Sierra 2s. The, the, the Sierra is very similar in design to the Akula. The big difference is the Sierra is a titanium hull submarine. And by the way, if you look very closely at that picture, you see some chunks taken out of the side. That's the anechoic coating that has fallen off during operation. Anechoic coating is a rubber material that absorbs acoustic energy. So very high frequency energy that might come from, say, a torpedo is absorbed reducing the torpedo's ability to detect the submarine. That's what an anechoic coating is. So the thing that these submarine that's got all the rest of the world scared today is this one on the left called Severodvinsk, Project 885 in the Russian parlance. It's a wonderful submarine, very modern, very quiet. Um, the first one was actually built kind of like a tinker toy put together of pieces of a leftover Akula that they never finished. But ever since the first one, they have built it from scratch, purpose-built, and it is improved in every way. It's very quiet, very capable, and dangerous. To the right of that is the Oscar II. You guys may remember that an Oscar II sank in Russia, 
and they they lost all the sailors when it sank. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Uh, yeah, um, the, the cursed. Right? Yep, the cursed. That's right. Five hundred and forty foot long submarine sank with roughly one hundred and thirty crew members on board. Everybody died. It was a weapon that exploded and uh, completely devastated the bow of the submarine. Below that, 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 these are all still active classes, by the way. Below that is the Bore, which is their new ballistic missile submarine. Um, it's also a very capable submarine. It's, it's in its second iteration of design now. It's unusual. There's some things about it that um, are just different. That unfortunately, I can't get into much, but um, the Russians are just, they, they march to the beat of a different drummer when it comes to submarine design. So the lower left, this is the infamous Kilo. I think everybody's probably heard of it. You've seen it in movies. They call it the black hole. The, the only way you find a Kilo is when it gets quieter around you instead of noisier. Um, eh, that's probably a little bit of an exaggeration, but the Kilo has been around for a long time now. There are actually several versions of a Kilo. The, the first one was called an 877, Halibut. The second version called a 636 is called Varshavyanka. And that's the modern one. That's a quieter, slightly longer version. And the Russians tried to replace that with a new submarine called an Amur, Lada Amur, but it had problems. And now they're building 636 kilos again. It's been so successful. Is the Victor gone? Victor, there, there is one Victor that's still in operation, but it, it's really a training platform today. Uh, bottom right is a Delta. Delta four was the last design and that's still operational. As they introduce the Bore class submarine SSBN, they will start to decommission the remaining deltas. But for now, that's going to fill the gap. That, by the way, I mentioned the Lada Amor, the submarine that they decided not to build. Instead, they built more kilos. That's the one in the foreground. The one in the background is the Severed Vinsk give you an idea of scale. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, this picture, Seb, but there it is. By the way, those little bubbles you see on the, on the port side towards the aft end of the sail there, that's actually a pop-out propulsion motor. The Russians are big on having little pop-out auxiliary motors that they can cruise around at a couple of knots with rather than use main propulsion. Another shot. You're going to see some more interesting details in a minute. There's a little cutaway. Uh, the interesting thing about Severed Vents, so I mentioned that they're going to multi-mode uh, submarines. Rather than have an SSGN, which the Kursk was, or the Oscar class, and then have fast attack submarines as two separate classes operated independently, they now are combining the features of both into one submarine. So if you look after the sail, you'll see that there are eight missile tubes back there that house missiles called the Caliber and Onyx, uh, very fast cruise missiles. So they're getting smarter about it. They're not trying to build 20 different classes of submarines now. They're focusing on two classes of submarines, Bore and Severed Vinsk. The uh, picture that you just showed earlier shows the submarine with the nose down. Is that common? It is common. Um, 688s, by the way, if you see a picture of a Los Angeles class from the side, they tend to sit bow up in the water. It all has to do with weight distribution of the submarine. And there's some other considerations. It's really not a, it's not a major design feature. It's just the way it works out once their ballast tanks are blown and they're, they're light on the surface. By the way, the Russians, you'll notice that this boat is riding high in the water. Notice the lower left, it's actually a little bit lower in the water. So the one on the lower left is likely does not have uh, ballast tanks completely blown. The one in the upper picture does, but notice how much higher they sit out of the water than U.S. submarines. That's because Russian submarines have a higher percentage of reserve buoyancy than our submarines do. Our submarines tend to sit lower in the water as a result. You see a missile there from that vertical tube in the lower right. You see it's vertical and then it's curving away pretty rapidly there. If you look in the middle picture at the aft end, you see the rudder there, that little circular thing there is the total ray tube. So the, the thin line 
toad array sonar, a passive sonar that's a couple hundred feet long comes out of that tube. Lower left is the escape pod. All Russian nuclear submarines have had escape pods. And they don't hold the whole crew, by the way, guys. <laughs> so I'd like to see that arm wrestling match when, it, when the time comes. That actually happened. There was a class of submarine uh, 40 years ago called the Mike. The Mike was a, was a titanium hull submarine. A lot of people have heard of alpha class submarines, a little small submarine, nuclear submarine the Russians built. Said it's the fastest submarine in the world. No, the Mike was actually the fastest submarine in the world at the time. And it was a 42 knot submarine at uh, flank belt. It sank in very deep water. Part of the crew got into the escape pod. It came to the surface. It flooded and went back down again. That was probably panicking on the part of the guys in the escape, escape pod. All right, so I mentioned Severodvinsk uh, was put together from pieces of an Akula. Then the next one after that was called Kazan, and you can see the difference in length of Kazan to Severodvinsk. Kazan is actually almost a completely new design, and that's the one that everybody is really hot and bothered about. This is the interior of a Severodvinsk. Um, I can tell you, if, if you've ever seen the interior of older Russian submarines, this is like Star Wars compared to the old ones. This is modern technology, touch screens, optronics, periscopes, optronics meaning they're electronic scopes that don't penetrate the pressure hull. So like a digital camera on a stalk, uh, much more capable. They're, they're into all of that now. More severed vents. And I'm harping on severed vents because it is such a jump in technology for the Russians uh, as a submarine. And but I'll be out of this in a minute. So there's that escape pod again. They test them now and they train pretty heavily. They didn't used to do that. It was also the first Russian submarine to have a spherical bow array called Ertish M4. And then lower right, by the way, one of the difference between us and the Russians is at low speeds, they use scoop injection for seawater. So rather than running pumps, which can make more noise, they let the water flow in naturally due to the speed of the submarine. Eh, we're still just as quiet. Um, and there's, there's pros and cons to both. How uh, many sailors can fit in that escape pod? About 12. And what's the <laughs> yeah, crew? 10% of the crew. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a few more, but not many guys. Um, and there you can see it pulled out of the sail. Okay. So where am I for time, guys? I'm trying to be good stewards of your time. Um, we're moving pretty fast now, though. This gives you an yeah, idea. You, of the you kilos. got about 15 minutes, Chuck. Okay. 877, called the halibut Varshavyanka, the 636. You see some, some pictures of that. By the way, a little bit of trivia. You can impress your friends. If you ever look at a picture of a kilo and you look at the bottom right picture or the bottom left picture and you see that step from the casing down to the taper on the stern, if it's got that step, that's a 636. That's a later version kilo. If it's smooth like the picture in the upper left, that's an 877. Trivia, I bet you will just cherish forever. Inside of Kyo, here's the Crystal AIP that I mentioned. A shot of it there on the right. Kilo, great submarine, quiet, capable, fantastic. Some more shots. They have Creeper, called Creeper Motors too. You see a picture up right where I say Creeper exhaust, Creeper intakes. Those are the little propulsion motors. In the case of the Kilo, they don't flip out. But if you look at the planes, the stern planes, you can barely make out that there are some propulsion motor mounting brackets on the upper right picture. That's not common in the class though. The more traditional means for Kilos is to have those ports. You see where it says exhaust creepers and intake. And those are just shrouds that go around a tunnel and inside the tunnel is a pr prop with an electric motor. So that's how they creep around at low speed, okay? Inside of a Kilo, wonderful model, by the way. Rubin Shipyard is the builder of Kilos and they put together this model. I, sh I saw it in an arm show a long time ago. It's a fabulous model. So you guys are modelers. You can, I, I'm sure can appreciate the detail that's in this thing. It's, all right, so now we're gonna move into this. Now, 
this is an interesting topic, guys. Uh, special submarines that do weird things. Uh, every bit of what I'm going to tell you now is, is from websites. I will make no comment about anything I know or don't know about this topic. The Russians, what I, we can tell you is, have built several nuclear-powered small submarines that go off and do special missions. We'll call it oceanographic collection. Your mind can want, run wild with the things that they probably do with these submarines. Um, they spend a lot of money on this stuff. Uh, and, and this one case is called the Uniform or Cachalot uh, Project 1910. Uh, very deep diving submarines. A lot of them have titanium hulls so they can go very deep. And you can see that little cartoon the Russians put together in the upper left. This is their material. They have grapples that can go down and pick things up. They have manipulator arms. They have lights, cameras, thruster motors, you name it. Here's one that caused a lot of sensation in the Western press several years ago. It's called Low Shark. So Low Shark, the name Low Shark comes from a cartoon character in Russian, which you see in the upper right. It's, it's a body made up of a bunch of spheres. So the reason they call this low shark is it's called a polysphere hull design. So the pressure vessels inside the submarine are a series of spheres that are connected by tunnels. You guys remember in the news recently where they said a bunch of Russian captains were killed in a submarine fire? Does that ring a bell with anybody? Yeah. If it does, this is the submarine. So they were in one of those spheres. A fire started and it killed 12 of the highest ranking Russian Navy captains in the submarine community. This vessel, if you look at the bottom picture there, you'll see that it has skids on the bottom so it can rest on the bottom. It's got manipulator arms. There's a real picture of it in the upper right and upper left, or a lower right and upper left. Uh, very hard to get pictures of this submarine. This is a titanium hull submarine. This is a submarine, or there's actually three now that support those smaller vessels. You can see the series of pictures on the right that show you they're actually, they dock with the host submarine and they're moved around that way. They also have a surface ship that supports these submarines on the lower left there. They have a converted delta there in the middle called the Orenberg. And that's it in the upper left as well. They lengthen the hull dramatically. Pretty fabulous. If you look where I have the two red circles drawn, you see that there is kind of an odd shaped contour to the hull there. That's where the dock occurs of the smaller submarine to the larger one. This spot right here. That's the section that was grafted into the hull. You move down, um, Belgorod, which is a converted Oscar class submarine. It's now the world's longest submarine at 602 feet. It was similarly modified to do these types of things. It carries unmanned underwater vehicles. It carries those small manned submersibles like the Low Shark and Uniform or Cachalot. It also carries the new Russian super weapon, which I'll talk about very briefly here in a second. Notice it also has an escape pod, by the way. So the Russians are really going after this in a big way. Screw design, you guys may have heard of the story of Kongsberg Toshiba many years ago. Kongsberg is a Norwegian company that sold Russians the milling technology and Toshiba told, uh, sold them the machine, machinery equipment and control equipment to be able to machine specialty screws or pro propellers that uh, we take for granted in the U.S. Navy, but the Russians didn't have until that point. So they basically sold the farm to the Russians to be able to mill high performance submarine screws. So you can see the history, 77, they had a five bladed screw. They tried contra rota uh, rotating to the right of that. In 85, they went to six bladed screws. And finally, instantly in 1989, just after Toshiba Kongsberg is when they came out with that screw you see there. And ever since then, they've had high performance submarine screws. They also delve and ducted propulsors and pump jets. This is actually uh, a kilo on the bottom that has a pump jet mated to it. This is the Alrosa. 
it's a test platform for the Russian Navy. And you can see a scale. You can see the, the gentleman standing on the scaffolding behind it. Or you can see how huge it is. The Russians are always, have always been great physicists and mathematicians. In the past, though, they lacked their refined production capability to build things like this, but they're beyond that now. Here's some more. These are all Russian screws you see here. Beautiful, by the way. And that, that cruciform looking shape of what's called the dunce cap on the very back of the screw there, that's a vortex shutter. So whenever you spin a cylindrical object in water, you tend to get vortices that spin off of it. Those vortices can create noise. And so this sheds those so that they don't generate unnecessary noise. And by the way, the little round silver things you see right here, those are zincs. So that prevents galvanic corrosion of the screw. Dissimilar metals and electrolytic contact, meaning seawater, will produce active corrosion. And so this is the way they prevent that. All right. Coatings, I mentioned coatings, I won't dwell on this. The Germans actually invented coatings for submarines to reduce acoustic target strength. Theirs was called Alberich, the first one, and then Tarnmat later, and that's evolved over time. The Russians' latest one is called Molnaya, which means lightning. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. We have our own, which I cannot talk about, but here's a typhoon that was being scrapped in the upper left, and you see the chunk that that gentleman is holding in the upper right? That's how thick it was on the typhoon rubber. This is a Sierra 2 in the lower left. You see the bolts that are meant to hold the tile in place, which was torn off at speed when it was underway. That's a common occurrence. The bottom right picture is the latest Russian coating called Molnaya. Okay, weapons. By the way, so it doesn't escape my memory, somebody asked about the plastic cover that was on our Mark 48s. It's covering something that looks something like this. I won't describe what ours looks like, but that's the reason why it has the plastic cover is to protect that sensitive sonar element. These are some Russian weapons. UGST is their version of a Mark 48. It also has a wake sensor on it. So that upward looking sonar you see right here projects upward. And so it detects the wakes generated by surface ships and they can track that wake for some distance and make an attack on a surface ship. It also has wire guide, which is this, what they call UGST cable pack right here. I mentioned the Onyx. Another name for that is the Ruby or Yakant. This is exported. Another torpedo shot here. This is a shipwreck missile, huge missile that's carried by the Oscar class submarine. It's, it's, it's nasty. Enormous missile, supersonic, big warhead, does lots of damage. Below that is the Sizzler. I mentioned the club or caliber. This is the latest Russian cruise missile, which is handled by Severed Vents in Kilo and is exported as well. Lower left is a super cavitating torpedo called Shkaval or Squall. It generates a steam blanket through the nose and it reduces friction as, the, as it moves through the water. It's rocket powered, very fast. Some reports say it does 300 knots, uh, but it's a, dumb, it's a dumb weapon. It's fire and forget. It's not actively guided. So the idea was you would get up close to an aircraft carrier, launch it at very high speed. They couldn't avoid it. And some accounts say that it was nuclear tipped back in the Cold War. So what's the propulsion on those torpedoes? So there are two types of propulsion in use today. One is thermal. So there are a variety of different thermal engines. Uh, I can't get into what ours are, but th they use hydrocarbons to propel them to their motors. They use an oxidizer and a hydrocarbon, propel themselves through the water with, with basically car engines, you know, a different, different design, but they're like car engines. So and assuming that, that a, a torpedo just misses, yep. how far can it go before it just dies? Um, so our numbers are sensitive, but a Russian torpedo, their claims are that they go 20,000 yards. Mm. Okay, so 10 miles, basically. Um, see what else I'm saying? Oh, oh, RAN. RAN is an active weapons producer today. Uh, I don't give much credit to the Iranians for doing much of anything worthwhile in submarines, even though they build a few. China, their big heavyweight's called a U-6. This one washed up on the beach in Malaysia, and a bunch of locals are, are checking it out. 
Malaysian military is out there. That's an exercise <laughs> torpedo. You can tell because it's got an orange painted nose. It doesn't have a real warhead on it. It was just a practice shot. But you don't like to lose things like that. Lower right, some more of the Russian 3M family. This is that caliber uh, that I mentioned, club, etc. So this is the super weapon. This has been in the news. This, according to Russian reports, is roughly a 75 foot long, four or five foot in diameter, nuclear powered, nuclear tip torpedo. Yeah. An Armageddon weapon. They call it Canyon or Status 6 in Russia. There's pictures of it in the bottom, real pictures. They've blacked out a few things like the propulsor on it, the screw. There's a handling tube in the upper left. And this was the submarine that was built to host it for testing, for trials. That's not the submarine that would host it operationally. If, if those reports are accurate, that is an absolutely incredible weapon. The way it would be used is it would be set off off the coast of a major port. It would create a vacuum because of the nuclear detonation in the ocean. It would suck in a bunch of water into that bubble it created, and then it would spit it back out as a tsunami and absolutely devastate a port city. So the, the theory is that they would probably launch these against a Navy base, for example, if you believe their, their hype. Sounds like you would do a lot of damage against a, a carrier battle group, though, too. Oh, my goodness. It, it, you know, we're, we're too good a people to do things like this, quite honestly. The United States would never do something like this. Um, unfortunately, the Russians don't have such an inhibition. You know, I, I may have had this wrong, uh, but in listening to you, I hear a huge diversity in terms of ship classes and weapons and things like that. Are the Russians expending their energies on, on multiple, multiple systems and classes? Uh, have they figured out what, or are they having trouble figuring out what the mission is or, or what? So there's a lot of literature that's pretty accurate out there, written by think tanks in the U.S. So this, these are not hack websites. The Russians are paranoid about us because they're afraid that our technological advantage can't be overcome with their own similar designs. And so they look, I use this word asymmetrical, they look for asymmetrical threats to scare us into, you know, as a deterrent, basically. So the idea behind their really fast cruise missiles is, they can't be easily defeated. The idea behind this thing is they could launch it, it could run deep, we couldn't stop it uh, until it did its job. So yeah, they, they, yeah they, they, yeah, they just constantly look for ways that one up us in capability because they're frankly probably insecure about their ability to defend against us. They're burning a lot of resources to do it. Oh my goodness. Well, so that's why the Russians took over Gazprom. You, Many years ago, the, the billionaire CEO of Gazprom was put in jail by Putin and the Russian state took over Gazprom and they used every bit of the profits from Gazprom to fund the Russian defense industry. Now that test submarine on the upper right, that has just the one big bow door that it would launch it through. Is it's it actually, can you see these blisters on the side? Yeah. That's, that's where they're launched from. They actually mm -hmm. load from the bow. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh. It's a really unusual submarine. It's actually a heavily modified diesel boat, probably a Tango class from way back in the 60s, but it's special built to, to do this test job. Mm. Some specialty sensors. Um, they have two kind of interesting sensors that uh, fascinate me. One is called SOX, and that's a wake detection system typically mounted on the sail of the Akula or on a stanchion up forward and some of their other boats and then SOARS, which is a radiation detector. Um, J John, you're, I think you come from the nuclear industry. I mean, the idea of a radiation detector being useful as the boats running through water seems odd to me because the signal to noise is really puny, but the Russians think they have it working. So that's two sensors that they use. Maybe they should have it inside the boat. Uh, Anyway, I, I threw the pictures up there. There's a story, but uh, I won't comment for, further on those. Uh, and a couple of designs of sonar that they've used over the years. The LADA, I mentioned, if you see the middle picture there, the LADA cylindrical bow array, 
the, the cylindrical bow arrays actually got some interesting advantages, like I mentioned, and they still have the Artish M4 on the sev on the lower left. Although the Kazan does no longer have a spherical array, it now uses a cylindrical array again. Okay, trying to speed up here. Active Chinese submarines. The Chinese are another prolific producer of submarines these days. A lot of their early designs uh, came from Russia. Uh, the Chinese copy everything with abandon. They steal everything from anybody they can steal from. That's, that's the blunt truth, guys. Um, so they operate these classes of submarines. They actually bought kilos from the Russians. Their initial SSBN called the Jia uh, was a copy of a, a Russian Yankee class SSBN. The Yuan you see type 041 there on the left a little ways is, is a, an imp well, they call it an improved copy of a Kilo, but it's very much like a Kilo submarine. Then you move down into their type 93s and 94s, which are their latest nuclear submarines. The 93 is a uh, fast attack submarine, an SSN, and the Gen or type 94 is an SSBN. And then one that threw us for a loop for a while called the Qing down in bottom right. This is, they name a lot of their submarines after dynasties, by the way, in China, uh, is actually just a test submarine for ballistic missiles. Two quick questions. When China, let's say, buys from Russia, what's the premium cost that is exacted so as to, would China pay twice the cost of a Severin disc? So, I mean, how do you prune a submarine from a country? So, number one, the, I don't believe for a minute that the Russians, when they sell a kilo to the Chinese, that the Chinese are getting all the technology the Russians have on their boats. So, right. they probably dumbed down the sonar. They probably dumbed down various other aspects of it. I do know that the Chinese reportedly, in one article I read, paid... $450 million for a kilo about 10 years ago. That is actually something of a discount over what the Russians claim they actually cost to produce. So who knows what arrangements they've made in the background. Best question, Does it is it profitable to dismantle and recycle submaterials, sub uh, the outside metal inside? I mean, do we just sink them or do we have the, the, the graveyards? Can is there a profit in dismantling and reusing materials from a sub? Oh, yeah. There's a long process, though, that NAVC, Naval Sea Systems Command, goes through to decommission a U.S. nuclear submarine. First of all, it's got to be deactivated, so they have to pull the core out. None of the stuff that's in a reactor compartment is recycled because that's, you know, for obvious reasons. Bad. Everything else, though, they remove all the weapon systems, all the electronics. The steel, HY-80 and older and HY-100 and newer, submarines has got value so it can be recycled and they do recycle it Thank companies you. bid on the recycling efforts when they're actually ultimately scrapped they do bid on it we do have a graveyard for submarines though there's one in the pacific northwest and there's several submarines that have been defueled decored and are sitting pierside ostensibly for war reserve though they'll never be reactivated it's, it's too expensive and too difficult okay Yes, thanks. Kilos active. There's 62 kilos active in the world. They're operated by seven different countries. Give you an idea. Torpedo tubes in the upper right. 209 submarines, the old German 209s, fairly small coastal diesel electrics. 59 active. Look at all the countries that operate those. They actually have eight torpedo tubes. You see in the bottom right. And they have some of the larger 209s have four engines. Some have three. That was the most ubiquitous submarine in the world until the Kilo started to proliferate. Here's another shot of the Japanese submarine. This is Taige. This is the first of the Soryu class. This is the one that's going to have the lithium ion batteries in it. Phenomenal submarine, very quiet. Scorpene class submarine, operated by four countries at present. You can see the number there and, and building. Scorpene is a French design. Some are built under license by other countries. Top is the Norwegian Ula, which is a very large version of a 209. There are four of those active. Those will probably be replaced in the next 10 to 20 years. Below is a Canadian Victoria class, which used to be the British upholders. Honestly, 
The British sold the Canadians a bill of goods. They gave them four submarines that were complete junk. The Canadians <laughs> have spent hundreds of millions of dollars getting those things operational. Now they're actually pretty decent submarines. I mentioned fuel cell on the 212 here. This is a German 212. Those are the hydrogen storage flasks. Very high pressure. I think the number is 10,000 PSI they store hydrogen at. Wow. Okay. Right. Um, sail design. The 212 is a fabulous submarine. Maybe, maybe the best diesel electric in the world. You see Norway has got four planned. We don't know if that's actually going to occur or not. Um, 212 continued. Here's a total array reel in a 212. You can see, actually see the array right there. That gets paid out through this shiv. Down below, you see the 212. The, there's a flip up door or hatch on the forward end of the sail on the 212. Divers can egress the submarine out of that. So their version of SEALs can exit the submarine through that hatch. 214. So the Germans are now building really good subs. Oh, yes. Phenomenally good submarines. Um, that not, then, yeah, that not only the 212, but they build the 212A, which is a, an improved version. They, the Germans are the only ones that operate the 212 design that they have. Um, the 214 is an export version. And you can see there, Greece, Portugal, South Korea, and Turkey operate those. Um, good submarine as well, just not quite as capable as the 212. Bigger though. This is the largest submarine the Germans have built since World War II. 233 feet, I think is what it is. Well, the Germans have been in the submarine business over a hundred years, I would oh, think yeah. by now. German engineering guys are still, still as good or better than anybody's really, if they put their mind to it. Um, here's an interesting story. The Dolphin class in Israel, there are five operational, there's one more building. They've ordered a few more. There's a Dolphin II class, which is longer, and that's a match for that 214 in length, 230-ish feet. Um, it is a heavily modified 209 submarine, but bigger. The first four Dolphin submarines were given to Israel by Germany as war reparations for World War II. And since then, the last two that they've paid for and the other order ones, they, they will fund. Won't dwell on it. Uh, North Korean Sango, you see down below. Uh, that submarine you see on the right up on blocks was actually captured by the South Koreans. Uh, the crew on board the North Korean Sango committed suicide, all except a cook who <laughs> ran from the submarine, ran up on the beach. He was captured, and he's now a South Korean citizen. Iran... I'll be uncharitable, guys. They're junk submarines. They do, have, they do have a few kilos, but they're constantly in maintenance. In fact, they're all in dry dock right now. I was going to uh, say, I just saw a report on that the other day. Yeah. They haven't moved for a year. Yep. They're all undergoing heavy maintenance, and they're doing all the maintenance themselves. They're not asking the Russians for help, which, you know, what could go wrong with that? Um, <laughs> anyway, they continue to plug along. They did, they did build the Fatah, which is you see there in the middle, which is the largest of their home-built submarines. But they're really, they are a threat only because the straight there, they could sit there and launch torpedoes at an aircraft carrier, but they're, they're certainly no match for any Western submarine. And then finally, there's Putin in a submersible. Putin loves submarines. That's why he's spending so much money on everything undersea. All right, so a little longer than I had anticipated, but can I answer any questions? Last question. Um... What's it going to take, if you're able to answer, to revamp the upper echelon of naval so as to be able to come out with, let's say, a Seawolf 2 that will compete, that will be uncompetable? So the Navy has always had the charter when it comes to submarines to maintain acoustic superiority. I have no doubt that what some people are calling SSNX or the next generation submarine will be a jump ahead of anything else in the world for, 
for quietness. Um, the problem we're running into these days is that technology is increasingly more expensive. I mean, think about it, guys. To build one Columbia class submarine, we're talking six and a half billion dollars. That is mind numbing. So to, to expect that the next generation SSN would be anything less than say four billion is probably silly. So can we as a country with a $26 trillion deficit already really afford to keep spending that kind of money on weapons? Uh, I don't know, well, but we better, uh, but, but we better do something. <laughs> well, you're, you know, I, I, I could never go down in a submarine. I just couldn't be underwater in one of those things. So congratulations. You're brave. But once no, I don't know about that. Yeah, it, it's, oh. I spent years of my life, literal years of my life under the water. Well, but here's the thing. Once the space force gets off, we could take all the submarine crews. You could put it up in spacecraft. It's the same idea. Instead of underwater, you're stuck in a big old tube out in space. Yeah. And now instead of torpedoes, you can drop rocks on the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we haven't even touched on what's going to happen with this Space Force thing. Because you know, we, we think submarines are expensive. Imagine what heavy lift to space costs for a major weapon system if that ever occurs. It would be phenomenally expensive. Yeah, but you need high ground. The one quick question, you know that movie with the Hunter Red October when the Dallas shoots and breaks the surface? Can it actually do that? You mean when the submarine pops out of the water? Yeah. Yeah, that's done once in a submarine's life. Wow. That's during sea trials. Know. And they do an emergency blow and the, the bow of the submarine, some some portion, significant portion of it will come out of the water. And it's not... Oh. By the way, I've done it one time. It, it only happens once. So it's luck of the draw if you ever get to experience it it is not any way as exciting as you think it might be yes the up angle is pretty impressive you're leaning way over forward to keep your balance but once you broach the surface and the and the bow actually comes out of the water it's actually a very soft landing i mean the submarine is so massive that it's just not as it's not as energetic as you think it will be yeah i thought it would smack like a rock on the yeah. surface but oh okay Angles and dangles is what we call doing sharp <laughs> rise and descent. That's fun. Uh, the only downside is coffee cups in the galley fly everywhere. People's belongings on their racks that aren't secured fly everywhere. It's, you know, it's a good rig for sea exercise is, is what you like to call it for the crew. It teaches them discipline about how to prepare to be underway. It, Chuck, uh, and if you can't talk about it, that's fine. We have, uh, compared to the, uh, the Russians, a, and even really to the Chinese, we have a much greater airborne ASW operation in the West than they do. Uh, do they carry any defensive weapons that they would shoot from, say, shallow depths to try and do a, a surfaced air missile takedown of a, of a Poseidon or an Electra or uh, back in the old days, the Nimrods, uh, to protect from being uh, detected from the air? Yeah, well, the Russians for a time used a shoulder-launched <laughs> missile called Estrella. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm familiar. They would launch it out of the sail. Of course, that's not very satisfying. Uh, first, you got to be on the surface for that to happen. Um, to date, so there has been some Western experimenting with things like that. But to date, I have not read any open source information that suggests the Russians or the Chinese are working on that. Our, our, our ASW, airborne ASW forces uh, pretty effective against their systems? Um, look, a submarine that's shallow is pretty vulnerable um, through a variety of detection means, even visible. You can be 100 feet below the surface in clear water and you can clearly see a submarine. Yeah. Stay away from, once, the, from the Bahamas. Yeah. Once a submarine goes deep, they're very hard to detect. Uh, it's just a fact of life. Now, active sonar is a different story. You know, if, if you drop sauna buoys or if a surface ship is banging away in active sonar, that's pretty effective against submarines. But 
submarine's got to be pretty close to that active source to be effectively tracked. Um, that's, that's the beauty of a submarine. It is an asymmetrical naval platform because you go deep and fast and generally speaking, you can get away from things. Uh, not always the case. Chuck, that was a good Submarine. presentation of uh, Mark Stevens. I worked, I was a chief technology officer for oceaneering for 20 years. So oh, I supported, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I supported uh, Was this. it uh, OTEC or what part of oceaneering? Yeah, I supported OTEC as well. I worked out of yeah. corporate, so I supported the OTEC programs. And yeah, I know a lot of people at Oceaneering. Yeah, yeah. So, and now I'm working at Microsoft. So, yeah. trying to keep as much sub work or sub fun as I can. <laughs> it was a great presentation. Yeah, well, thanks. Liz, Liz, I'm sorry, another last question. I'm not going to say last. Can submarines, our submarines, fire torpedoes to create a bubble wall so as to defeat sonar because of the turbulence? Like, shoot a a torpedo 10 miles out because they they sense you know like you say banging or pinging is there a way of no. neutralizing sonar no not not high power ship mounted hull mounted sonars no um however every navy that operates submarines uh, those submarines are equipped with countermeasures and countermeasures operate in a variety of ways. The Russians have some that make bubbles. Others make acoustic sounds to decoy torpedoes. Yeah. So every submarine, combat submarine in the world has got some, some type of an acoustic countermeasure on it. Right, of course. And you know, one thing we didn't talk about with, uh, with weapons is mines. Does, does anybody in, in terms of their operations use mines, uh, submarine laid mines? Yeah. As, you know, a major threat. Yeah. So I won't comment on the, the U S because that's weapons yeah. tend to be a touchy subject in the U S. Right. Um, the Russians certainly have uh, submarine launch mines. Uh, we used to have a program called captor. Yep. Uh, that was, Project engineer for that for a while. Yeah. So those, I mean, we, we've dabbled in that. I won't, I won't say anything about current practices in the U S Navy. Um, slim submarine launch mobile mine. Many, uh, navies have submarine capacity to launch mines. How about that? Mines are yeah. terrible. That's yeah. bad business. And of course, you know, the interesting thing, I don't know whether you follow the mine technology now, they're uh, essentially coming up with a mine package that you just wrap around a, um, a 500 or a thousand pound bomb that you can put a JDAM kit on or anything else, but the That's mine right. kit goes on and the buffs just spray them everywhere. Yeah. There's a reason why Iran has invested so heavily in mines. They are just, it's a low cost way to raise havoc in an area. Especially a narrow. Yes. The only thing is they tend to be with some exceptions. There are some pretty sophisticated mines in the world, but many of the mines, most of the mines are indiscriminate in what they target. You know, they're floating and they have horns, detonation horns or their magnetic influence. And they don't care what, what the platform is above them. If they sense something that's magnetic or they make contact, they're going to go boom. <laughs> Great talk. Yes. Well, believe me, guys, I would love to spend all day talking to you about submarines because there's it's just endless, the topic. Um, we, have, we have another area that you can, uh, I don't know whether you've researched, and that's um, privately owned submarines. Uh, actually, I have. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's an interesting area. Yeah. So I, I can tell you this. I, I was just thinking about whether I should say anything about this or not, but it, it's, it's, it's been overcome by time now. At one point, I was asked to look at private submarines as a potential way for the narco traffickers to, to deliver narcotics. Yeah. And yeah, if they're willing to spend the money, they can buy a submarine that's more than capable of doing that. Yeah, I, I forgot I've seen photos of them. Yeah. I've also uh, been on the one off Waikiki Beach, you know, the, the little tourist yes. submarine. <laughs> and now the drug uh, traffickers are uh, traffickers are building their own submarines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
And they're mostly deca wash, right? Or, or, or true submersibles. Now that's the, so that what the deca wash thing is the semi submersible, one of which is called Bigfoot. Yeah. Um, I've had some experience with Bigfoot, but the, the latest generation, it's a submarine uh, in the true sense that everything but the mast is below the water, but they, they keep a snorkel out of the water con continuously. Uh -huh. um, they're fiberglass hulled, they're about two inches thick. They have Yamaha diesel engines for propulsion, very crude. They have a porta potty uh, seat in the back for the crew to go to the bathroom. I mean, they're disgusting, but um, they're, they're real submarines. Yeah. And they're built in the jungles of Columbia and wherever else. Yeah. Uh, there's them pictures the of them on the internet. You can find them. Um, yeah. yeah, but they're, I mean, drug traffickers have a lot of money. They have more money than some navies do. So, um, you know, they, they can buy whatever they want. Bad um, joke would be you could put a lot of kilos on a kilo. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the story goes that uh, some Russians tried to sell some drug traffickers a whiskey-class submarine years ago for, I think it was $50 million, and it was a fully operational Russian combat submarine. You can, you can watch that video on uh, Netflix. Whiskey oh, really? on the rocks. Uh, is, is there any truth to the, the YouTube rumor that um, a rogue Russian submarine is going to launch a nuclear missile at Hawaii? So, hmm. I, I, I doubt that, guys. I, I, I can give you my opinion on that because I never looked at that directly uh, in my time. Uh, I, I just don't think that really happened. I think if you're talking about the one that sank off of Hawaii, ultimately, I think right. what probably happened is they were on a training exercise. They had an accident. They lost contact. The, the boat sank because of the way submarines operate. Uh, you know, your, your AOR commander, your fleet commander doesn't know where you are 365 days a year. He only knows where you are every so often. So I, I think that was just an accident, pure and simple. Yeah, it upset my wife because she's from Hawaii. Nah. The Russians, the Russians may lack judgment occasionally when it comes to the perception of threat that exists for them in the world, but they're not stupid people. So I, uh, I don't think that happened. And at that time, by the way, all Russian submarines that carried nuclear weapons had political officers on board. And you couldn't launch a nuclear missile. You can't launch a U.S. nuclear missile without two people. So you can't launch a Russian submarine. You couldn't launch a missile without at least two people being involved. So one, one person can't launch a nuclear missile for good reason. You know, what if you had a bad day and, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, Chuck, uh, really appreciate it. Uh, we're going to have to probably wrap this up now. We got to get to the uh, contest result. Sure. Um, I, I've, I know I've still got your address, and I will be sending you a, a thank you coin from the club. Um, appreciate it, and uh, we'd love to have you back again uh, sometime, uh, maybe next year, to uh, uh, talk with us again. I'd be so, happy to. Uh, sure. Yeah, we we really appreciate it. It was a great. Uh, presentation uh very interesting i think um everyone would agree with that so uh i'd uh, love to have you back sometime all right my pleasure thanks a lot thanks guys. chuck yeah thanks night. chuck really uh, interesting maybe uh maybe you can take a look at what's out there in the model world and tell us which submarine kits are good bad and different or pretty close to the real thing well you know if you can get your hands on john didn't didn't i sell one to you was it yeah, you? yeah skipjack Skipjack, that's a neat kit. Uh, yeah. Of course, a modern submarine, it's not like there's a lot of, it's not like a muscle. Somebody said muscle car earlier. By the way, I had a 1971 Hemi Cuda when I was. Boom. You know, there you go. Oh, there we go. There yeah. we go. Uh, <laughs> they're not like that. They're very streamlined. They're kind of boring to look at, but it, it's a big kit, right, John? So yep. it, it's, it's impressive. But the, the, the um, World War II boats that are being built by Trumpeter and... Um, who else is building one? Ravel. Ravel. I mean, I had one for a while that was exquisitely detailed. So, and they made all sorts of, you know, uh, what I'm, what's what I'm looking for? The kits with the uh, 
screen printing and and uh, oh, the photo etch detail kits photo etch yeah yeah Gosh, I lost my mind there for a minute yeah I, i'm not into models like you guys are but i have built plenty over time and i, I love them I, I just i have too many hobbies as it is i i yeah, I do know the um, the Ravel product guy spent about two days, three days um, with the Germans uh, for their U-212, 214 kits. Yes. So they, the, the German Navy and everybody opened up and said, here, we want a good kit. My closing remark is I got a tour of, of the 212 when it was over here for a, uh, you know, share the love cruise. And um, that's a fabulous submarine. Anyway. Guys, thanks. Thank, Thank you, you, Chuck. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.